Why did I screw the whole thing up? Tell me. Hello. Здравствуйте. Hello. Hello, everyone. Taras Vinokur here. Gird your loins, people, because it's time for a review of Leon Trotsky's Literature and Revolution. Now, this is a controversial figure, to say the least. Among Leon Trotsky's extremely diverse set of accomplishments are the following. He was one of the main ideologues, intellectual architects, who set up the climate for Russia's disposal of feudalism and autocracy. He was second in command after Lenin during the Russian Revolution of 1917. He was also the main opposition leader, uh, spokesperson against Stalin after Stalin had outwitted him, so to say, and snatched the Soviet throne from Trotsky's unassuming hands. Trotsky was also the leader of the Red Army that fought the Civil War. I should also add that Trotsky's ideas and theories impacted enormously the Soviet politics of 1920s and also left a considerable footprint in ensuing politics of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s even. Trotsky is responsible for a distinct and momentous theory of Marxism, which is called, fittingly, Trotskyism. This theory advocates proletarian internationalism uh, through the process of uh, permanent revolution. It advocates democracy on a massive scale, and most importantly, it advocates working class self-emancipation. Trotskyists, or followers of Trotsky, do not dig Stalinists with their brutal, hermetic, dictatorial bureaucracies which plunder and alienate the working class. From this follows that one of the more fortunate reasons why Trotsky assumes a role of a historic, momentous figure is epitomized in his opposition to Stalin. Trotsky led the, the Marxist anti-Stalinist movement which spanned through Europe and Asia and even the United States. This was a movement that sparked a lot of intellectually potent discussion around the topic of Stalinist decadence. Decadence. Trotsky was also one of the first people who critiqued rather brilliantly the darling of National Socialism, Hitler. This clearly paints a picture of a man in action, of Trotsky the, the revolutionary, Trotsky the soldier, the picture of a man who walked the walk and talked the talk in the name of Bolshevik-Leninist cause. I will discuss Trotsky's Brace Yourself literary criticism his original, a tour de force, take on socialist aesthetics. Now, at this point, you might be asking yourself, if Trotsky was such a controversial, polemical figure, who, you know, for example, so enthusiastically advocated a German socialist revolution, which would have most likely resulted in a massive bloodshed and and many other controversial things. Why is it that I speak so fervently about him today? Well, it is because I will be talking about aesthetics, hermeneutics, as well as literary criticism, and even though politically, historically, this, this figure definitely deserves criticism, I'm not ready to discredit his whole intellectual edifice this lightly, and thereby, and thereby engage in ad hominem fallacy. People, you know, people that make political decisions which are controversial or even wrong can nonetheless hold views that are extremely interesting and say things that are true. Consequently, consequently in this video, I will focus on Trotsky, the Trotsky, the man of ideas, the man who, with such people as André Breton and Rivera, wrote the Surrealist Manifesto. The man who took off, disappeared for a couple of months in order to write a piece of Russian literary criticism. Literature and Revolution. This brilliant, captivating book deserves a close reading for its nuanced and plentiful content alone. 
Trotsky discusses presents a historical analysis of Russian literature. This is already quite an undertaking. More importantly, Trotsky scrutinizes literary trends from the perspective of the October Revolution of 1917. That is to say, Trotsky looks at the temporal and dissident and consequent artistic and literary reactions to the revolution, as well as the effect that the Russian Revolution had on writers, authors, and artists alike. Trotsky looks at specific, you know, more important, more significant authors and the ways in which they facilitated, commented on, or undermined the revolutionary cause. Trotsky also analyzes major literary trends of the day, such as futurism and proletarian lit literature. Throughout this book, Trotsky defines the par parameters of the literature that is forward-looking, pro-revolutionary, full of self-determination and awareness of material basis. And to disappoint you, Trotsky, Trotsky is not talking about socialist realism. It's more complicated than that. Throughout the book, Trotsky criticized some literary trends and exalts others, naturally. Let's re reiterate, at that point, Russian socio-political arena was like a crucible of conflicting, daring ideolo ideologies and actions. Consequently, Trotsky tries to synthesize the hodgepodge of literary trends and voices by juxtaposing them with the revolution. Some of the trends in Trotsky's view stand relevant and victorious, while some, some, of, some of them are you know, backward and utterly opportunistic, naturally. The other very important accomplishment of this book is the blazing critique of Russian formalism a school of literary criticism which revolutionized the way we look at the poetic text. Russian formalists, Russian formalists actualized the specificity and autonomy of a work of literature. Trotsky dedicated a whole chapter for the uh, discussion of Russian formalism. For me, the antagonism between Trotsky's thought and Russian formalism is a very stimulating instance of the debate as to what should hold more significance in aesthetics, form or content, social political awareness, commentary, or exclusive attention to aesthetic forms. Throughout this review, I will look closely at these opposing opinions on aesthetic theory. So, on the whole, this review will try to carry out three things. A, substan a substantiation of Trotsky's distinct take on socialist aesthetics, his use of the Marxist method, coupled with the literary, literary illustrations found in, in the Russian literature of the time, and an, al an, an analysis of the debate between Russian formalists and Trotsky, and a short discussion of the lessons to be learned from this book. What can, what can this book teach us today? So let's just get one thing out of the way. This book deals with Marxist aesthetics. Even though Marxist criticism has not consistently agreed about such questions as how should art reflect society or you know, critique society or how should art imagine utopian uh, ideal society, Marxist criticism does usually agree that art should comment on or at least be closely linked to material necessities of life. All forms of life, says Trotsky, will be, that is after the revolution, permeated by artistic impulses and techniques, the, the cultivation of land, the, the, the planning of human habitations, the building of theaters, the methods, the methods of socially educating people, the solution of scientific uh, problems, the direct opposition between art and all branches of techniques will become of paramount importance. For Trotsky, then, the, the revolution brings about an artistically enchanted society wherein artistic practices permeate the routine, everyday, you know, humdrum life. He says, we will fall between art and industry. This means that the development of post-revolutionary art will combine the elementary troubles of 
food, clothing, shelter, with the advancement of art. Trotsky, in his introduction of this book, says the development of art is the highest test of the vitality and significance of each epoch. Post-revolution uh, Russia is a state that deserves to attain this vitality because it is the beginning of an epoch in its own right. In other words, revolutionary seed has been planted. New form of art, which brings material necessities and aesthetic forms together, will flourish. According to Trotsky, the new collective spirit that was erected by the revolution divides among those who accept the revolution and those who struggle against it. Those who resist revolution are only capable of reviving the old art with antiquated just, uh, gesticulations and proclamations, so to say. Those who cultivate the so-called new art, they devise new landmarks, expand the parameters of creative spirit. To be sure, this can only be achieved, according to Trotsky, if the new art is at one with their epoch, that is of post-revolution. Trotsky states that there are ways in which supposedly new artistic movements are very much locked in with the past. Trotsky speaks about Soviet, you know, rustic, schmaltzy, peasant singing literature, which could could not be imagined without nobility or bourgeois. Trotsky thinks that peasant singing literature is hypocritical. You know, it, it never comes from peasants. Trotsky also criticizes Russian futurists who wanted to break with the past and to liquidate, liquidate tradition. To the contrary, Trotsky said, the working class does not know the, the old literature. It still has to commune with it. It still has to master Pushkin, to absorb him, and so overcome him. This can be related to what Trotsky say, says later in the book. Though the proletariat is spiritually and therefore artistically very sensitive, says Trotsky, it is uneducated aesthetically. That is to say, workers were restricted in the past, according to Trotsky, from acquiring elements of bourgeois culture. Trotsky claims that it is ridiculous to say that the working class should not bother with bourgeois, feudal, or ancient, you know, classic past. Artistic revolution, coupled with the October Revolution, according to Trotsky, should constitute a classless society where there is no such thing as proletariat and therefore there is no need to be afraid of the bourgeois or feudal art or any other form of art for that matter. You know, Trotsky says that a work of art should, in the first place, be judged by its own law, that is, by the law of art. Therefore, Trotsky advocates holistic approach to art. It's, it's totally appropriate to learn about all kinds of art, whether bourgeois or otherwise, as long as this self-education does not result in a kind of artistic mysticism, whether, you know, frank or masquerading as... Uh, romanticism. Even after the working class revolution, Trotsky said, this class cannot begin the construction of a new culture without absorbing and assimilating the elements of the old cultures. After all, the post-revolutionary person should be able to de deprive himself or herself of aesthetic obfuscation and Ill alienation. Trotsky says that revolution starts from the central idea that collective man must become so master and that the limits of his power are determined by his knowledge of natural forces and by his capacity to use them. New art, the way Trotsky envisions it, is incompatible with spiritual collapse. There can be no pessimism, skepticism. Art ought to be realistic, you know, active vitally collectivist and filled with creative faith in future. F future. Trotsky gives us specific examples of literature that does or does not accompany the revolution. Trotsky thinks that Russian subjectivists, idealists, were naive in thinking that mind and critical reason 
moved the world, that the mind moved the world. Trotsky points out that poetry might be fit to embellish the sunset, you know, but the day is always the time for action. All through history, says Trotsky, mind limps over after reality. Russian subjectivists are therefore at best, you know, sluggish and naive. Trotsky critiques that interrevolutionary period after 1905 failed revolution, when a whole generation of Russian intelligentsia was formed by the efforts to con uh, conciliate monarchy, nobility, and bourgeoisie. Here, Trotsky critiques Leonid, uh, Leonid Andreev because he was promoting the bourgeois reconciliation through his melancholy and world weariness. Trotsky critiques uh, Andrei Bailey. For Trotsky, Bailey is the most condensed version of inter-revolutionary decadence. Bailey is in love with the great meadows of Russia. He lives in previous epoch, according to Trotsky. Bailey wants to replace the world with himself. This pathetic individualism, furthered by old customs, is unbearable for, uh, to Trotsky. Bailey is therefore simply out of touch. Trotsky appreciates Nikolai Kluev because he's not rustic, he's not peasant singing, and schmaltzy, he's actually a peasant. Kluev accepts the revolution, however, he has no historical perspective perspective in Trotsky's view. Trotsky considers Sergei Yesenin to be promising, young and flexible. However, this Im imagist poetry can be rather burdening and sl sluggish. Trotsky thinks Yesenin might still deliver something in the future. Serapian Brothers, or Serapian Fraternity, the group of writers in Petrograd, Trotsky thinks that the most dangerous thing about Serapian brothers is their lack of principles. They're thick-headed, according to Trotsky. Boris Pilniak, according to Trotsky, is a realist and, ex and an excellent observer. However, Trotsky critiques his uh, venerability and thinks that his technique is sometimes uneconomical. Trotsky also critiques Marietta Shaginian because she's anti-revolutionary in her very essence. Her fatalistic Christianity and her indifference to everything everything that is not part of her household. Trotsky doesn't appreciate that at all. As for Alexander Bloch, Trotsky thinks that Bloch belonged to pre-October literature, but he managed to overcome this and entered into the sphere of October when he wrote the 12th. That is why he will occupy a special place in the history of Russian li literature, according to uh, Trotsky. Alexander Bloch, according, uh, according to Trotsky, does not belong to the revolution, but he did manage to reach out to the revolution. I already talked a little bit about futurism. Trotsky dedicates a whole chapter to the topic of uh, futurist uh, literature. I will only reiterate. Trotsky thinks that futurists want to break with the past. They're unaware of the fact that masses will still have to learn the past so to say. In accepting or critiquing artists, writers, and, and genres, uh, Trotsky tries to make sense of the artistic reaction to the revolution. For him, there are some authors who uh, became out of touch because of all that was happening at the time. There are also some authors that did prove to be imaginative and forward-looking. I have to emphasize, though, Trotsky's account of the arts is far from biased towards this plastic, artificial kind of socialist realism. Trotsky says, you know, our policy in art during a transitional period can be and must be to allow the various groups and schools of art complete freedom of self-determination in the field of art after putting before them the categorical standard of being for or against the revolution. Well, that's the only criteria for, Trot for Trotsky. Being for or against the revolution. Here I reach the next important part of this review, where I will discuss Trotsky's opposition to the Russian formalism. Russian formalist school of literary criticism was extremely interested in the way the poetic language cultivates, cultivates literariness or defamiliarization. To put it another way, poets 
you know, poets roughen the surface of language, engage in defamiliarization, as one of the Russian formalists Shklovsky would put it, and in so doing, poets create obstacles on the way to meaning. You know, poetry does, doesn't just talk about the subject matter or the topic. It doesn't just propose something or question something. It, it, it creates arabesques, labyrinths, on our way to subject matter, topic, proposition, or inquiry. It creates a rebus. Consequently, Russian formalists wanted to find out where the structural processes in poetic language that accompany us on our way to meaning. Hence, for Russian formalists, the meaning is not that important. It is rather the formal structures that play a leading role in formalist analysis. Eichenbaum, one of the Russian formalists, states rather clearly in his theory of formal method that literary critics should attain more precise science. And that's exactly what Russian formalists do. They talk about science, foundations, and structure of poetry. Meaning is not that important. Well, you know, Trotsky has a problem with that. There's a bit of a beef in there. Trotsky argues that formalism is extremely arrogant and, frankly, immature. Formalists are only capable of reducing their task to an analysis of etymology and syntax of poems. Formalists count repetitive vowels and, you know, consonants. They count syllables and epithets. According to Trotsky, even though it is useful to engage in this kind of formal analysis, it nonetheless is rather subsidiary of an undertaking. For Trotsky, the preoccupation with the form is an aestheticism, which allow formalists to turn their backs on history and to turn their backs on class struggle. One must understand, says Trotsky, Russian formalism as a partial, scrappy, subsidiary, and pre preparatory form of analysis. Finally, what are the ways in which Trotsky's book can be relevant to us, you know, today? I'll re I will repeat again, you know, nobody is arguing that there ought to be one way of making art, that of socialist realism. One could not possibly blame Trotsky for such an argument. What Trotsky says is that we have to understand the history of the political evolution and development of material conditions if we want to understand the art. For example, after the civil rights movement in, in 19, 1960s, uh, women's liberation, tr struggles for gay and lesbian rights, such things as women's literature, gay literature, black literature are suddenly you know, popping out popping up, you know, un they're, they're suddenly understood as part of the canon. You know, the same goes for Hispanic literature or Native American literature. Historical changes which rendered the culture more, you know, multi multiculturalist and egalitarian also rewrote the history of literature. Our sense of literature is much richer simply because the political reality has changed and in turn it changed the artistic idea ideology suddenly we have so much more than just the white male literature and we keep discovering more trotsky says that all artistic changes have social basis remember trotsky says that mind limps after reality hence we should understand that it's not enough to reinterpret reimagine the world to quote Marx, you know, uh, 11 pieces of, uh, on Farbach, we have to also change the world. Thank you for listening. See you next time.